um, today out on this very rainy day, which is also a very important day in Charlottesville. Um, it's the first day of the Liberation and Freedom Days. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, this, well, I'll start by introducing myself. So my name is Emily Burrell. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an associate professor in the history department, and I'm a member of the NOW Lab uh, here at the Carter Institute of Democracy. And this talk today, is part of a series um, that's run through the NOW Lab called Touchstones of Democracy. And you can see the schedule on the screens in the room. Um, this is the second Touchstones event of the semester. We have another one coming up in April on uh, the ancient citizen. But today uh, we are here to talk about Leopold Senghor and Senegalese democracy. And we are very fortunate to have a guest uh, who is also a dear friend and colleague. Uh, Sarah Zimmerman. I'll say a little bit about you before we launch into our discussion. Um, so Sarah Zimmerman is a professor of history at Western Washington University. She received her PhD in history from Berkeley in 2011. Um, and she has written a number of different articles and chapters on a number of different thematics uh, pertaining to West African history, French Empire, um, Thierry Senegalais, who we will talk about a little bit today. Um, and she's also the author of a book uh, that came out in 2020 entitled Militarizing Marriage, West African Soldiers' Conjugal Traditions in Modern French Empire, which was the flagship book, or is the flagship book of a series published by Ohio University Press um, on war and militarism in African history. She's been conducting historical research in Senegal for, and I estimated here, over 15 years. Yes. It's fair to say, right? Yes. Uh, over 15 years. And she's currently working on a second major project um, that concerns historical representation, memory, gender, and enslavement on Gore Island and the Senegambia, uh, among other things. And we were talking about that yesterday. And the reason I, I tell you this is so you have a little bit of information about her, but also I think a few of these different themes are going to come up uh, in our talk today, notably Thierry or Senegalais, and maybe, maybe how people remember and tell certain kinds of stories about the past. So thank you for being here with us today, Sarah. Thank you for having me. So um, we wanted to start things off by just saying a little bit about Leopold Senghor. I, I think that probably some of us in the room have a sense of who he is. And for some of us, he may be a very new figure for us. Um, I wanted to start by saying that there's a lot that's been written in the world in multiple languages about Leopold Sedar Senghor. Um, he was considered to be one of the founders of the Negritude movement. We'll say a little bit about that in a moment. Um, he was the first president of Senegal, uh, elected in 1960. He's a major intellectual figure and political force of the 20th century. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to talk about him and a lot of different ways to examine and analyze his own writings through the lens of philosophy, through the lens of literature, or by examining his influence and his force as a political figure. We are approaching our conversation today primarily as social historians who work in West Africa. And I, I say that because um, we won't have time today to get into a lot of the, the details of, of different strands that one could go into in talking about him, but it's to give you a little bit of a sense of our orientation towards him um, as people who work in the 19th and 20th century in particular. Um, so who is this man? I'll say a little bit about him and then I'm gonna ask you to step in with your own work. So. Leopold Senghor, uh, Leopold Sedar Senghor, he was born in Joao, Senegal, 1906. Um, he was the son of um, a peanut merchant and farmer. Was he a farmer, his father? I think he yeah, more commercial merchant. agent. Yeah. yeah. Actually, say a little bit about Joao, because we were talking about this. Where he's okay. from. Um, Joao is a oceanic entrepot in the Sensilin region of Senegal. Um, and it has a long period of contact with the Atlantic world. Um, Joal, uh, as early as sometime in the 17th century, had Afro-Portuguese populations. Um, and so this is a site that was well connected to places like Gore, 
to the Cap Verdean Islands um, and had also long been a site of implantation of Christian missionary activity. Mm -hmm. So um, this is where he grows up. Um, he goes into a Catholic um, mission school when he's a very young boy. Um, uh, it's a, a school run by the Fathers of the Holy Spirit when he's eight. In 1922, Leopold Senghor, at the age of 16, enters seminary, Catholic seminary in Dakar. But um, he is told that he's not fit for the cloth at a certain point. At least this is what the literature tells us. Um, and um, then he moves on to a secular education um, shortly thereafter. So he's about 16 when he moves from a Catholic education, training in a seminary into a secular education. And by this point, he had already um, established that he had a great passion and propensity for language, French, Greek, Latin, um, and also apparently algebra. In 1928, uh, when he was 22 years old, he sets off for France. Um, and he started post-secondary school in the Sorbonne. Um, eventually, he ends up going to Lycée Louis Le Grand, which was a very elite institution in Paris that educated other political and intellectual elites of the time, including a man named Georges Pompidou, who becomes president of France uh, later on. So he has a very extraordinary, specialized elite um, education at a young age uh, in France, but all the while through this experience is always, uh, it's always reinforced for him that he is, he is a second class citizen as, as an African, as an African man. Um, and this is something that he writes about later in his poetry, which I'll say a little bit about. Um, he receives his degree, he teaches um, through the mid to late thirties uh, and enlists in the French army in 1939. Um, at the rank of a private within the 59th um, colonial infantry. One of the reasons this is notable is that he enters the French army, um, he enters the French army and is in the colonial infantry despite the fact that he had held French citizenship beginning, beginning in 1932. So again, another contradiction in his life or another, another uh, reminder of uh, the limits of what it means to be uh, so-called assimilated in the French colonial experience. Um, while he is uh, in World War II as a soldier, he's captured. Um, he's captured and he is held in a German um, prisoner of war camp um, in 1940. Um, there are many accounts, he accounts some of these stories himself, but there are many accounts that he he came very close to being um, killed in a firing, um, by a firing squad. And um, is ultimately, he and the others who were with him um, survive really by the skin of their teeth. Um, while he's a prisoner of war, he teaches himself German um, and writes quite a bit of poetry, which becomes an important part of his oeuvre and which informs sort of the person who he becomes um, really at the time, but also later, um, during his formation in what's called the Negritude movement. So while he's in Paris, he meets up with a man named M. A. Cesar, who is an intellectual from the Caribbean, and another scholar, Leon Damas. And together, um, these men really, um, they come together around their shared experiences as Black men um, who are intellectuals, who've been significantly influenced by movements like the Harlem Renaissance, if they have received educations in France and um, in their home, in their home um, sort of national territories. And it was always reinforced that they were second class citizens throughout the whole experience. Um, so um, while so I'm going to move quickly through Negritude, which is a, is a social history move, because we want to talk about his presidency and his politics, because this is the Karsh Institute of Democracy. Um, so Leopold Senghor writes very important tomes of poetry. Um, he's involved in this journal that's at the core of the Negritude movement. Um, and he's on a tour in 1946-47, um, promoting his poetry when he meets Lemine Gay. 
a very important Senegalese politician who encourages him to run for the National Assembly. And I wonder if uh, you want to take it from there. So it's, tell us a little bit, this is sort of the, the advent, so I've just sped us up really fast to the advent of what we consider to be Leopold Senghor, uh, Leopold Senghor Senghor's uh, political career, because this is really the stuff that we want to get to and talk about. So say, I don't know if you want to, you want to jump in there and say a little bit about what happens uh, there. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I guess I'll say that I think that, you know, despite producing a, a lot of poetry during the, the war years, I, I believe that like Leopold Seder Sanger also did become politicized in some ways or became more open to a particular kind of politic um, that he approached kind of thinking about a reorganization of empire because you know, the Third Republic fell during the Second World War. And in the reconstruction of, of, the, of the Fourth Republic, there were long discussions about how empire fit within French Union, which this, this new French Union that was going to kind of emerge in 1946. And he was very interested in the organization. Um, he was interested in citizenship for all mm -hmm. of, of the people who were within French empire at large um, mm -hmm. without having a kind of differentiation between mainland French citizens and French citizens of empire. Um, there was a compromise in terms of using the language of citizenship in 1946, but it was clear that people who were in what was considered former empire and now part of French Union, being Sub-Saharan Africa, um, French Indochina, and among other sites, um, that they were citizens but could not exercise their citizenship. Um, and so Senghor had been quite interested in a kind of singular French union that incorporated all of empire as well as a singular French citizenship and was interested in a single electoral body. And instead what happens is the French create a kind of two tiered system of electoral politics, um, but it does expand the electorate. And um, after meeting Lamine Gay, um, who was a bit of a political elite. Um, he was an originaire um, from one of the four communes of Senegal. So he was born into French citizenship. It's a fascinating anomaly. Mm -hmm. I will not speak to it more at this moment, but I'm happy if there's Q&A later to give some more details about the four communes of Senegal. Um, but Lamine Gay was a talented lawyer. Um, he was instrumental in eliminating forced labor across uh, West Africa in 1946, um, and also in some of these talks um, that were empire-wide in 1946. And he reached his hand out to Leopold Senghor Senghor and said, you know, come with me now that there's, a, there's expanded opportunities for um, a kind of broader number of deputies to come from French West Africa to participate in French National Assembly, why don't you begin to do some of the political work. And this is actually a moment in which you see Senghor do some of the kind of traditional things that we kind of affiliate with democracy, right? Mm -hmm. um, because democracy is a project. Mm -hmm. And so he becomes very interested in 1946 and 1947 in stomping in the rural areas of Senegal. Um, Lamine Gay is more accustomed to elite nepotism. Right, um, working and and I and I have a very big place in my heart for Lamine Gay. I actually really appreciate him for a lot of for a lot of reasons. Um, but because he was an originaire, because he had kind of been born in a particular kind of political climate, he hadn't put a lot of energy into kind of animating the masses um, towards um, uh, towards voting. And Senghor does this. And so he builds a lot of relationships. And what's fascinating is he builds these relationships in a number of directions because he's able to rely on a new friend. And this is important because he'll come back, Mamadou Ja. Um, Mamadou Ja is a different kind of politician. He speaks Wolof a lot better than Senghor does. Senghor um, is from a Sawer speaking region of Senegal. Um, and he could speak Wolof, but kind of haltingly so. And so Ja helped him kind of bridge um, religious differences. Senghor was Christian, um, much of Senegal, most of Senegal uh, was Muslim at the time. But there was this facilitation between Senghor, able to 
kind of make these bridges and cultivate regional power via Marabou's Sufi Islamic leaders across Senegal, um, who had a lot of power in the production of cash crops, particularly peanuts, um, and really showed a true talent um, for being diplomatic and um, deeply political in terms of bridging differences, being able to make promises when he could. This was in the 1940s, in the second half of the 1940s. Um, do we want to jump in here and say, so Mamadou Ja is also a hero and a problematic favorite, as is Lamine Gay, a hero and a problematic favorite, as is Leopold Senor. Um, in fact, we're going to talk about a lot of these complicated people in a very short period of time that we have. But something, uh, what's really striking, and I, I like the way that you put this, you know, one of the things that we recognize as truly democratic that Senor does very early on in his career is he, he is savvy, he is savvy in the way that he engages Mamadou Ja, because without Mamadou Ja, he arguably could not have engaged a rural public um, in the colony of Senegal. This was never anything that Lamine Gay was particularly invested in, oriented towards. Um, and something really important happens in 1947. Mm -hmm. um, so even though Lamine, Lamine Gay had reached out to Senghor a few years early and really enlisted him in this political project of representation in the National Assembly. The two of them split in a really important way in 1947. Um, maybe we could say a little bit about the railroad strike and talk about no. why this is important. And for any of us in the room um, who have read um, God's Bits of Wood or Les Bouts de Bois de Dieu by Usman Samben, this is the, this is the moment in the book. Yeah, 1947, you have this major railroad strike on the Dakar Niger Railroad, um, and they held the line, right? Uh, at first, it is um, something that the French kind of colonial bureaucracy is doubtful of, thinks it will go away. But eventually, the tenacity of the strikers um, really kind of convinced the French administration to deal with them. But this strike does lead to this split that you've been alluding to where Lamine Gay sides against the strikers mm -hmm. and Senghor sides, sides with the striking railroad workers. Um, and because of this split, Senghor goes on with Mamadou Ja to form the um, BDS, the bloc, the democratic, the Senegalese democratic bloc, the BDS. Um, and some time passes, and in 51, they win the seats in Senegal, mm -hmm. right? And this is a great shock to um, some of the people like Lamine Gay, but also others who have been participating in um, Senegalese politics for quite a bit longer. And Gay loses his seat. He does. Yeah. He loses his seat. So we see the rise of, of Senghor in this time in the 50s tied to his ability to engage the masses through the railroad strikers. Um, and also through the stumping and the campaigning that he does with Ja. Um, and um, he really becomes instrumental. I don't know if we want to say more about the 50s here. Um, yes, yeah. if, you, if you don't mind. Because yes. um, like, I'm just going to skip ahead to the question skip you're going to ask. I know, I jumped like, over that. Question. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of how my research has encountered. Yeah. Um, Leopold Seder Sanger. Um, and so, you know, I wrote a book on West African soldiers who served in French colonial empire and engaged in conjugal relationships all over empire. Um, when I was doing this research, um, the politicization of veterans uh, in France and French empire um, is something I think that there are enough people nodding in here that just to say everyone knows about. <laughs> um, but this had to do with pensions, the equalizing of pensions. Um, and this became a particular hot moment um, while I was conducting research and interviewing veterans. Um, I was not interviewing veterans who served in World War II. I was interviewing veterans who served in French Indochina and Algeria in the 50s and 60s, well, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and what I found while I was conducting research is a lot of people assumed that I was doing research on the World Wars. Mm -hmm. And it would be very interesting to see who would bring Senghor to me. Mm -hmm. Right? They'd be like, oh, well, you've read this poetry, you know of Senghor. And I'm just kind of like, do I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's how I had to kind of come into kind of like thinking about the ways that I would kind of engage with him. And in the end, because I, you could read my book if you want, I skipped the second world war generally. 
Um, no one's taken me to task for that yet. There's um, been enough written about this. Yeah, I, I feel, but at the same time, um, you know, his poetry was very powerful in the kinds of conversations about blood debt. And this is something that Greg Mann has written much more about um, in a book called Native Sons. Um, and the kind of relationships of reciprocity between the French state in the colonial period and in the post-colonial mm -hmm. period. Um, but I found Senghor in my primary research in very kind of strange places, because once he becomes a deputy and is mobilizing funds in the 1950s and is very active, he's actually very good um, in terms of building political bridges within parliament in France. Mm -hmm. um, but he crept into my research when I was looking at um, conjugal relationships between West African soldiers and Vietnamese women um, in Indochina um, between 48 and 54. And he becomes very interested in and writes several letters. I, I feel like he didn't sleep, he just wrote. Yeah. So um, <laughs> but uh, he wrote several letters and then kind of created an emergency plan to evacuate abandoned children that were obviously of West African descent in Vietnam, um, because he became aware that these children were starting to come back with returning repatriating soldiers in the Tiananmen Square Senegal deployed in forty eight. So the first ones were coming back in fifty, and children were showing up in Senegal, and he and he was just like, "What is this?" and looked into it, and then just kind of created programs to kind of pick up orphans and have them brought to West Africa. Um, and this is in the 50s? This is in, the, mm -hmm. in 52 and 53. So this is when he's mm -hmm. in the National Assembly. No. Yeah. And so he can mobilize funds in certain mm -hmm. kinds of ways, um, but he is at least paying attention to some of these issues, mm -hmm. which I found to be kind of surprising. But at the same time, he was a veteran. So I'm, I'm curious if, like, because of the networks that he was in, he kind of paid attention to these issues. Mm -hmm. um, he did, you know, the 50... One of the things that we've been talking about um, in preparation for this, and Sarah and I have known each other for a long time um, from when we were graduate students. And so in some ways, these are very long conversations that we've been having about our common work. Um, the Sengor of the 50s is very different from the Sengor of the 60s, the 70s, and certainly very the true. 80s. Um, so the Sengor of the 50s is very, um, is very active in state building enterprises, um, Sort of the work of, of the work of um, really holding the French government accountable to their word, which is that they are representing um, they're representing the territories, and he's committed to um, something called the federation. Right? Yeah. He's not he's not in line with um, he's not in line with um, decolonizing moves that would separate Senegal. From France entirely, what he wants is more buy-in from the French state in terms of how they're going to incorporate citizens of the territories. I wonder if we want to say a little bit about what that meant to him um, and the shape that that ended up taking in terms of um, how he articulated a political strategy and then what this meant for him when he became the president. Let's see. I just had a Tiffany, while yeah, you're saying this that. This is why, and so this is why I, I these are conversations. That, that you can really see in the 1950s is his talent for working within systems. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, and I think that once he become like once he becomes the leader of Senegal, mm -hmm. things happen differently. Mm -hmm. But I think working within this system and trying to make it as just and fair as possible, kind of in the iterations of the African or the, the French Union and then trying to kind of re-articulate what's happening with the community, mm -hmm. uh, the French community, mm -hmm. as it was called in 1958. I think that those are the moves where he's trying to kind of argue for and find a means to redistribute power within mm -hmm. French empire. Um, and so in 1958, the Fourth Republic falls and then there's a, a um, an effort to redesign the French Union namely as the French community. And something that Senghor is very much invested in is maintaining federation. He's not interested in Senegal becoming an independent country. He is interested in maintaining ties to create powerful blocks mm -hmm. of French West Africa mm -hmm. and French Equatorial Africa. So these large federated colonies that France has in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and 
what I thought was a real interesting move. Um, <laughs> so I think possibly people in this room know um, what happens with Guinea in 1958, right? One of the few kind of sites within French West Africa that vote no to community and opt into immediate independence. Mm -hmm. um, and, do, and, and Sekou Touré did so kind of brazenly in terms of speaking back to Charles de Gaulle when de Gaulle goes on this tour to kind of cultivate support for the community um, in 1958. What's interesting is when de Gaulle comes to Senegal in 1958 to promote a yes vote into the French community, both Ja and Senghor are out of country. <laughs> They're just conveniently out of country. Like Senghor is in France with his in-laws and Ja is seeking medical treatment in Switzerland. So they kind of remove themselves from um, this particularly and very poignant political moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I still haven't kind of figured out what the strategy yeah, that was is interesting. I for that. I about that. Um, but Senegal does end up opting in. Yeah. But by 58, it becomes clear that different members of a very kind of broad political party called um, I'm like, oh. I know, the English translation <laughs> would be. The RDA. The RDA. Yeah, the Rassemblement uh, Democratique Africain. Africa. Yes, thank you, the RDA. Mm -hmm. um, and that had been an attempt to kind of unify across the eight territories of French West Africa, as well as bring in um, different member states of French Equatorial Africa. Um, and by 58, because of various debates have been going on about independence, mm -hmm. It's clear that this kind of federated community that, that Senghor was invested in and some others were also invested in are not, is not gonna work. Um, Félix Houfouy-Boigny wants to opt out because he thinks Cote d'Ivoire is going to have to carry these other countries because of the power of the economy um, in Cote d'Ivoire. Also, Boigny is very committed to um, maintaining a strong relationship with France. Yeah. I think Senghor is largely ambivalent about some of this after he comes to realize that um, about, he's largely ambivalent about immediate independence, I should say. Um, and then, you know, what comes out of it is all of these other potential member states of federation in West Africa eventually fall by the wayside. Um, and it ends up becoming like Sudan Francais mm -hmm. and Senegal. Mm -hmm. And Sudan Francais ends up becoming Mali, but, the, but it emerges as the Mali Federation in, April 1, 1960. And it lasts for two months, basically. Yeah. 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 Because of Moody Bikata. That's I'm right. Kidding. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> just saying it's because a lot of my work has mostly been in Mali. And so a lot of these conversations we have are about are across the Senegal. Yes. Um, but Bubakar Bar, I would argue that all of that is part of the, of the great Senegambia. That's right. The greater would... Senegambia. So, um, so, where to go from here? So Senegal becomes independent. Senegal is, um, Senegal, Senegal becomes, um, you know, a sovereign uh, country. Senghor is the head of this state. Mamadou Ja, who we talked about earlier, is his prime minister. And what and is that? the minister of defense. That's right. And is deeply involved in constructing and implementing an economic plan yes. for Senegal. Do you want to say a little bit more about their tortured, difficult, important, tragic relationship. Did I give away too much? <laughs> no, no, no. I feel bad for their relationship, right? Um, it seems that in the 1960s, they begin to have different visions of the future. Mm -hmm. And most of the historiography that I have read focuses largely on Senegal, but I think that there is something to be said about the kind of broader chaos of things with the dissolution of the Mali Federation, mm -hmm. changes that are going on in other places on the African continent, um, the Congo, yeah. um, uh, various attempts to create new kinds of Pan-African institutions, mm -hmm. um, and you know, efforts to reshape the world. 1960 was yeah. this flashpoint in which many political leaders across the African continent were really excited right, and the possibility, right, like nothing, there was nothing that could be the limit, and then we find out there were limits, but um, so there was a great excitement in trying to redesign politics according to the ways that new political leaders wanted. Um, Mamadou Ja, right, had been the right-hand person of Senghor, 
And he had really fostered those relationships with the Marabu. Um, and he had a great um, kind of connection to rural animation. That's right. Um, and he was very interested in economic independence. Mm -hmm. um, he was also interested in decentralization of power yeah. um, across Senegal. And he was also interested in um, making kind of agricultural sectors public. Yeah. So this created problems because Senghor had strong ties to France um, and various kinds of French companies. Um, and Jia was very interested in kind of untethering those relationships. Um, and this leads to a variety of things. Um, and Jia was kind of like, obsessively interested in economics. Yes. Like there are stories of him, like just sitting at the table, kind of crunching numbers about produce mm -hmm. across, across Senegal. Mm -hmm. um, and he was kind of distancing himself in, in some ways from, from Senghor. And rumors begin to fly that he is um, kind of manipulating various ministers that aren't seen to be as Senghorists mm -hmm. and potentially kind of building power in other ways. Um, and so a group of people that support Senghor kind of come forward to put a censure on Ja. Um, and this is in 1962, mm -hmm. late 1962. So just two years into independence. Yeah. Two years into the I mean, and this also becomes kind of a book by Ousmane Samben, yes. right? The Fond de l'Empire, the end of mm -hmm. empire. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's like, if you read the nitty gritty details of this, it's clear that a lot of things are kind of not known about what happens over the next couple of days. But in the end, Seng Or accuses Ja of an attempted coup d'etat. And then Seng Or kind of has Ja and other kind of identified um, uh, conspirators arrested. And then Seng Or just steps back and lets the constitution do its work. Mm. Um, and so they, Many of these men are convicted. Um, ja himself is sent to life imprisonment in Kedagu in the far east of Senegal. Um, others have shorter periods of imprisonment, like Dr. Zhou and Jai, um, um, and then Senghor is like, I'm good. Single party state, we're gonna redo the constitution in 1963. We're gonna eliminate other political parties. Um, and this this changes yeah. politics mm -hmm. within Senegal quite rapidly within mm -hmm. independence. Mm -hmm. um, and Ja, it does not spend life in prison; it spends twelve years in prison. But that's still a very long time, right? So, one of the things that you're signaling um, that I want to just share with our audience is that um, there, one of the things that's so interesting about talking about Senghor and the and Senegalese democracy is that there is recently, um, I would say in our professional generation, a move to re-examine Senghor as a political figure and to re-examine the 60s, in, the 60s and the 70s into the 80s, mm -hmm. especially. And so one of the things that you were just speaking to is this, um, for those, who, those of us who are really interested in trying to make sense of what happens in Senegal after independence, understanding what happens with Mamadou Ja and the split, and then why and how Senegal very quickly becomes a single party state um, in a move that some might consider somewhat authoritarian mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a constitutional democracy. This is not, this is not what people anticipated seeing in, in Senghor's, um, Senghor's Senegal, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, there's something else that happens. I mean, there are a number of things, of course, that happened in the '60s. But one of the one of the other historical moments that um, historians are turning to, uh, especially right now in Senegal, is the is the strikes of 1968 mm -hmm. and Senghor's role in the 1968 strikes. And I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit about that, and also remember how important the strike of '47 was for him as a political. Yeah, career. I think that um, it becomes interesting because. There are there just before sixty eight. There are these kind of dissatisfaction among syndicalists, um, mm -hmm. among students, um, with 
the way that Senghor is kind of redesigning government. Mm -hmm. um, there still are a lot of ministers in his government that are French, mm -hmm. um, and they have very good salaries um, to kind of be built into what French salaries would be in mainland France. Um, he relies on uh, a French minister, actually, uh, a French, born French, becomes Senegalese citizen after 1960, um, named Jean Quillin, um, to do some of his less, uh, like, less poetic yeah. work. And that's we'll a say. great way of describing less poetic it, work. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there are these movements among students that are occurring in 1966. Those are repressed in order to create a great space for Fesman. You know, this enormous festival that occurs in, um, in Senegal in 1966, the big festival of Black Arts. And so there's a bit of a repression of protest in that particular period against students at the University of Dakar at the time, which is now the University of Cheikh Um And then the Fesman happens and the whole world is like, oh, this is awesome. Senegal's great. You know, Senghor opened the doors to a large Pan-African community to kind of democratize the arts globally, mm -hmm. right, one could say. Um, and so there is this kind of undercurrent that's also happening. And then, you know, in May of 68, um, students are on strike in Dakar, um, professors are on strike in Dakar, various um, unions are on strike as well because they want pay raises. They're not getting, and students aren't getting kind of distributions or pensions as they are expected to mm -hmm. in 21st century North America, I think it's difficult for us to understand like yeah. students getting a pension mm -hmm. to go to school and survive and eat and have access to books and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but they were all calling for kind of raises in these pensions. They were calling for the government to kind of reconcile the kind of high salaries of these bureaucrats um, and not, and kind of neglecting these other sectors within the state. And there is, police repression um, of these activities in late May, it's May 27th, 8th, 9th of um, 68. Um, one student is murdered um, by these forces and over a hundred are injured. Right? Um, and the movement continues in a variety of ways. Um, one of the militants, uh, and I say that in the French sense, one of the activists, activists. yeah, one of the yeah. activists, um, who actually has, and so this kind of goes back to like when we started first talking about doing um, doing this, um, I was thinking a lot about Omar Blondinjo, um, who has resurfaced mm -hmm. in kind of contemporary politics that are kind of anti Macky Sall, who is a contemporary president of Senegal, um, that are anti neocolonialism, that are anti French. Mm -hmm. like. France Dégage is an organization that has kind of used um, Omar Blondin Jop's image as well as that of Amilcar, Amilcar Cabral mm -hmm. and Thomas Sankara. Mm -hmm. Leopold Sater Sanger is not in that pantheon mm -hmm. that contemporary kind of like radical students are using. Um, and Omar Blondin Jop was a student activist. He toured. Mm -hmm. um, uh, extensively to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. He was from Niger originally. Um, and he is imprisoned, uh, not in 68, but he is later imprisoned in the 70, early 70s. And he dies in prison on Gori Island um, in what is now the Museum of Senegalese History, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the Faroq d'Estre. Um, and he dies in 73 in prison. And mm -hmm. he's been kind of held up as a symbol um, against an image of Senghor. Right, as a kind of benevolent founder mm -hmm. of, of the French state. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a great tension over the state's narrative of why Omar Blondin Job died. Mm -hmm. The state claimed it was suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and Omar Blondin Job's supporters do not believe that. That's right. Yeah. Um, so you're signaling in a lot of ways. Um, this is, um, again, what I was saying earlier, there's a historiographical. Um, sort of movement underway to make sense of the 70s, make sense of the 60s mm -hmm. in new ways. Um, Senghor is um, president for 20 years. That is correct. Um, he, um, he, he willingly leaves office. He's one of the first um, 
African heads of state to, to do this. And the president, he, he, he paves the way essentially for Abdu Juth, who was his prime minister to become the next president of Senegal in 19, 1981, I think mm -hmm. technically. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know I just jumped over some decades, but for this, yeah. Can I, say, can I say something yeah. really quick? I do think that Senghor did learn something from the student protests of 68 and um, from the protests that surrounded the death of Omar Bin Jup, mm -hmm. because um, he begins to realize that he's surrounded by old people. He himself is an old person. He's including himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so after 73, he invests a bit in locating a much younger technocratic class. Um, yeah, that's true. That won't really challenge him, mm -hmm. but will bring a different kind of base to government. Yeah. Um, and Abdu Juf is among them. Yeah. Um, and I think after the elections in 73 or 74, you actually have a, like over 40 people in office who are under 43. Which is um, remarkable when you think about mm -hmm. some um, of the other things going on yeah. across 1970s African continent. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, by the mid-70s and then in 1976, um, he begins a, mu a move towards a kind of curated democracy, mm -hmm. opens up and says, we'll do three parties now not just the singular state, we'll do three parties and one will be to the left and one will be to the right of my party. <laughs> yes. um, and lo and behold, his party won again. Um, but so that I think he does recognize like near the end of his political career and he is anticipating the end of his political career in some ways um, that Perhaps Senegal, Senegal's kind of governmental structures are not how he wants it, and and mm -hmm. and 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 not kind of living up to what he hopes the future will be. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, when he is preparing his departure, I mean, this is when Senegal is just slammed by the global recession and then structural adjustment programs and neoliberalism. Um, and the, the Sahel drought happens yeah. in the seventies, which yeah. is just devastating that for someone well. in West Africa. Um, and then he retires in 1980. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, one of the things that's so striking to me about Senghor, when we were talking about this, is he's a man of many contradictions and paradoxes. He's a complicated figure. He's clearly a genius. He's also clearly, I liked how you described him as someone who works well within institutions. And then when he becomes the head of state, it becomes, things start to look very different. Um, I'm also struck by the, I, I, I sort of see these strikes. I'm increasingly seeing these strikes that are separated by about 20 years as very interesting benchmarks in his career. Um, you know, he is, a, he is someone who, um, whose character, whose sort of, whose political life and whose, um, whose um, investments in a lot of ways come out of the fact that he was very involved as a student. He was a, he was very involved in student movements. He was involved in in um, sort of future gazing reforms um, that African students were really invested in in the forties. Um, and in nineteen sixty eight, he I don't know I, I I'm I'm very struck by these by these, these sort of pieces of his story um, and how they shape who he becomes um, as a political leader. Just sort of putting that out there as a Something to think about. So what would we say when we think about, okay, so here's the question. We're in, we're in the now lab, we're we're in a touchstones conversation. Um, uh, what do you think is the Senghor legacy? What is it? I know, I know, I know it's a big, you're not gonna give the full answer. That's a very big question. Um, when we when we think about what what Senegalese democracy um came to be because of Senghor. What are some of the things that we might, what are some of the ways that we might describe democracy um, in Senegal um, under Senghor and, and who do his who do his who do the people who come after him, what do they inherit from him in terms of either a constitution or in terms of um, a political apparatus? 
I'm, I'm just, I'm like, I'm an early 20th century historian. Um, but you have a lot You have quite a lot to say, let's say. Um, I think that after he died in 2001, he did, you know, he did receive a bit of a, of a renaissance, right? Mm -hmm. There was a kind of flurry of publishing yeah. between 2001 and mm -hmm. 2007 or eight ish. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the election of Abdullah Wad was seen as an ex a success and a kind of counter narrative to the one party state that yeah. um, Senghor created and then Abdul Juf um, perpetuated. Mm -hmm. um, but then everyone became very disappointed with Abdullah Wad pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not everyone, maybe not his loyalists, but um, I, I remember going to Senegal for the first time shortly after Abdullah Wad was elected. And um, there was still a kind of excitement around, around uh, the kind of opposition figure of 40 years, mm -hmm. right? Because Abdullah Wad represented Mama Juja mm -hmm. in the trial that eventually led to Mama Juja going into prison. So and the first time I went to Senegal, Abdullah Wad was under house arrest. So this is the man who becomes <laughs> president, yes, after Abdul Juf. Um and so I think well, it's it's interesting to kind of think about a contemporary political moment, right? Because there are elections on the horizon in Senegal. Yeah. Next year. Um you have Maki Sall threatening to run for yet another like the specter of the illegal third term has been one of the 21st century. Um, Abdullah Wad threatened it um, because there was a change in the constitution during Abdullah Wad's first um, tenure or for his first term that um, presidents would be limited to two terms um, and presidential um, terms would be reduced from seven to five years. Um, and then Abdullah Wad decided during his second term that that law didn't apply to him for his first term because he was grandfathered in. Um, and so there was this, that specter of Abdullah Wad running, well, he did run for a third term yeah. and then Maki Sall won. And th that was a kind of mm -hmm. real um, creative alliance yes, that was kind of to kind of oppose Abdullah Wad. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were a lot of people who were very unsatisfied with Maki Sall and the kinds of political shenanigans that he's been engaged in in terms of imprisoning potential political opponents two years before an election to make sure that they're not eligible to run. Which is happening right now in Senegal and journalists are also being detained. Yes. So this is a real challenging moment. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to something that you said earlier that made me think about the, the current moment that Senegal is in right now which is that you described Senghor um, in a moment of political crisis shortly after his election, shortly after the creation of an independent Senegal, you described Senghor as letting the constitution do its work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would describe Maki Sall right now in Senegal as gesturing towards letting the constitution do its work in sort of shoring oh up, yeah. in, in sort of his effort to shore up um, a legitimate run for a third term. So the, what I want to say, it, it, instead of us getting too in the weeds, even though for mm -hmm. us, this is really, you know, we're really, what's happening right now in Senegal really matters quite a lot for democracy and it matters for people who care about Senegal and it matters broadly, um, I would say in the world. But one of the things I want to maybe let us leave on or open up for question on is um, the power of the Senegalese constitution. I actually should. Yeah, pivot. Uh, yes, you can. Okay. Yes, you can. Say that something that I don't know if this is a legacy of Senghor, um, but there is a legacy of student and youth movements yes. in Senegal. That's true. Yes. Right. And so something that I found to be quite creative and quite powerful was the emergence in that 2012 era when Abdullah Wad was running for an illegal third term, where you see the emergence of urban youth, and not just Dakar, right? Mm -hmm. Kaulak was activated, Chess, mm -hmm. Ziegenshore. Um, and so you do see a movement of youth, and this kind of really manifested in um, hip hop groups, like mm -hmm. taking over the streets, um, hip hop collectives, I should say, taking over the streets. Um, I was very lucky to have um, members of um, Yanamar and um, Old Chat and Khalifa um, come out to Washington State um, to speak to students, which is really fantastic. Mm 
um, after the elections and the kind of mobilization of um, civil society. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if mm -hmm. one of the legacies of saying, I don't know if I want to credit him with it, but like something that I think does exist within contemporary um, Senegalese politics and the kind of the, where you can like locate democracy in these politics are, are the actions of civil society. Yeah, I think that's, I, mean, I agree with you. And I actually, I think that's a great place for us to sort of open up discussion, but I, I like, yes, this idea that um, one of the things we see as historians is the strength and continuity of civil society and student movements. Um, and, the and I would also say the return to the constitution, the, the power of the Senegalese Constitution. People, to sort of, yeah. people are invested in the Constitution, and there's a lot of robust discussion and political literacy in Senegal around the Constitution. Um, and um, and we'll see what happens next year. Yeah. So um, on that, I would say you know we've been talking for about fifty minutes, um, and we want to just open. I think it's it, this is a great time to open up for questions. Um, or comments if um, people want to engage in a conversation with us about this. Yeah, and maybe say your name and then and then speak speak um, with mine. David Throop. I uh, have taught political science at uh, George Washington for many years, and, uh, been an associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I, I just retired to Charlottesville. So. Congrats. Um, <laughs> I'm perplexed that you didn't say more about the relationship between Senghor and Hufwe, because listening to what you had to say, it seemed that really they viewed the world in the 1950s from very much the same perspective. And yet they were political rivals. Senegal was always very much detached from the Rassemblement uh, and did its own thing. Uh, was it simply personal animosity, jealousy of each other's leadership of Francophone Africa, uh, or were there actually ideological cleavages? Because I didn't get any from, from what you had to say. That, that's my question. My observation for the 1960s is that Senegal is just like everywhere else. You know, if you look at what's happening throughout West Africa or indeed East Africa, uh, Senegal is very, very much part of the general picture. It's uh, having problems with post-independence, uh, ethnic rivalries and cleavages, just the same as everywhere else. And the response of Senghor is precisely the same as Kenneth Kaunda or Jomo Kenyatta or, or anybody else you care to mention as one of the, the great nationalist leaders of the 1960s. And my final observation is, I, for many years, I was a British diplomat. And it always struck me that when I dealt with African diplomats and African administrators, uh, you could always rely on the Senegalese to be extraordinarily professional. The, the caliber of the civil service in Senegal was on a, on, on, on a level most unusual say, for many independent African states. And therefore, I'd be interested to know about the importance of the civil service, the administrative structure. You didn't say anything about that, but I would actually see that as a fundamental scaffolding for, for the political state in some way. So we can address this, or should we take more? We do, should we respond to this? I would say that actually, um, I think we both agree with you that that Hufei Boigny and Singh are quite distinct people. I think in an effort to get to certain points to make, perhaps we glossed things. But Boigny, Hufei Boigny is the leader of Cote d'Ivoire. Um, the two of them, um, I mean, I think I I've never thought of them necessarily. I, their similarities are that they're both um, they're both more invested in aligning with. Um, I would say French structures, particularly economic structures, than some of their other contemporaries like Modibo Keita, um, certainly Sekou Touré in Guinea. I think that's that's in a shorthand for one way of thinking about similarities between the two of them. And they were both really concerned about Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal 
having to shoulder the burden of the, of the rest of West Africa. These were powerful colonies, um, strong economic bases. Um, but I don't, I, I, I mean, I actually would agree with you. I don't see them as necessarily similar political figures. Would you, I know what you, I'm, I work more in, I, I work more in that field. I till that field a little bit more than, than you do, um, but I wonder what I you I see them as very similar political figures. You except, see them as very similar? Except they're on different sides. And I'm trying to comprehend what divides them other than personal rivalry. Because ideologically, I think they're, they're almost identical. I think one of the, well, go ahead. I, I think that I'll kind of link a couple of your comments together, which is I think that because Dakar was head of French West Africa, um, it had a lot more bureaucratic structures and bureaucratic possibilities in the post-World War II era. Um, and a lot more schools that were available for people to be trained in um, various kind of bureaucratic technocracies, if that's a word, or technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that Senghor, you know, despite a kind of singular state move that happens after 63, is still very interested in maintaining governmental structures that follow those that were built in the colonial era. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think Hufle Buanyi finds a lot of his power to lie with the French. Um, his ability to maintain his office over, he was in office for over two decades. Three decades. Yeah. Um, and the so elephant. the old the elephant, elephant. Was um, and yeah. And um, I think that he, more than Senghor, was willing to waive the threat of a French military invasion mm -hmm. to quell opposition mm -hmm. more than Senghor was, though mm -hmm. Senghor was happy to have the French military kind of in the background during the crisis in 62. Um, and not, 68, he engages the French military. Um, yeah. Something that I do see dissimilar between them and this might go to your other comment, is Senghor's commitment to portraying himself as a politician, right? Like as a removed diplomatic politician. He never attempted to build a cult of personality around himself. And his understandings of Africanization happened very differently mm -hmm. than Hufi Wani or uh, Mobutu Sese Seiko or um, other political figures of the 60s and or 70s. Kenyatta. Or Kenyatta as well. And mm -hmm. do you think that, I mean, and maybe this goes back to negritude, which we moved over um, to get to sort of wanting to talk about political stuff in terms of more formal, but I wonder how much of this is I mean, this does go back to the fact that we're talking about someone who was a philosopher. He was a man of languages. He was someone who is invested in um, education, education, language That's, education, in yes. particular. And 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 that, I mean, that I think. I mean, it's interesting. I was thinking about the questions or the comments that you were offering, and in some ways, Senegal. And now I'm moving to the second part of your question. What happens to Senegal in the 60s is, is the story of what happens in so many parts of Africa in the 60s. These are Cold War struggles. These are, these are the limitations of economic possibilities and political alignment. Um, even though we have the promise of the third world there, it's a very difficult for African leaders to, to realize certain kinds of futures in the 60s. And that's there is a commonality in that. And yet there is, a, there is I mean, I'm someone who always avoids exceptionalist arguments. But there is something, I mean, I'm thinking about the point that you just made about Senegalese bureaucrats being skillful and, and invested in the civil, um, sort of the civil state. And I do think that that is something, I think that's a characteristic of, of the Senegalese state. Um, I think it's something that, that um, has a long history. Um, and so yes, the 60s, what's happening in Senegal it's tied to what's happening elsewhere in the continent, and yet there is something different about Senegal at the same time, and yeah. it's tied to these other pieces. Yeah, and I'll, I guess I'll just say kind of finally, because 
your questions are making me spin in a lot of different directions, and I do want to give 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 um, give some other people some room. But like something that I kind of wrote about in my dissertation, that old dusty thing um, that didn't make it into the book, was that it was kind of fascinating how different West African leaders in independence treated people who had worked in the colonial bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Additionally, Tihaya mm -hmm. um, because after 58 and then after 60, many of these active soldiers are actually demobilizing from Algeria. Um, and Senghor embraced them, brought them into the new newly forming state, um, got them into various kinds of industries where their, their, tool, their, their tools could be used. Um, Wanyi, when soldiers came back from Algeria, was just like, go back to your villages. Yeah. Right. Um, and so even though he was kind of a Francophile, I think that he had a different attitude towards using the skills of people who had served within the French bureaucracy. And, and the, the military was an extensive bureaucracy in um, French colonial West Africa. Yeah. Yes. Um, Laurent Dubois, I'm the weird at the Carson Institute. Thank you so much for this. It was a super engaging conversation. And I was I had two questions. One was this kind of constitutional question, or the tension between the fact that the constitution was maintained under Sandro, but it was a one-party state. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious, like, how did that work, right? Was there a did he, he wrote it? Did he so he wrote the constitution in order to allow for a one-party state? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but is that was that then revised? After Songo and the newer constitution, or under okay. Juve, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay, pretty so pretty immediately after Juve becomes president. Uh, okay. Well, it was written in seventy six to allow for the three party state. Right, right, yeah. Um, but what I do find fascinating is that it's not just thrown away, right? Like it's edited. Over right, they, over they again. refine it's it. It's like right. this yeah. piece of paper matters, right? I mean, that's because because I haven't been in Senegal. Always, you know, this, I'm so fascinated. But yeah, the, the relationship to the constitution. Yeah. Is very strong, yeah. right? And so the sense of maybe of the perfectibility of the constitution. Yeah. Um, but he so he does he write the constitution after that after the coup attempt or the okay got it. So there isn't one before that. There is a constitution. There is a constitution, that. It is rewritten. but it's re oh, yeah. he rewrites it in that sense. Yeah. But then the other question, and I don't know about this in the constitution or more broadly, is you know one often hears about the, the his long term impact on kind of religious tolerance, yes. right, and yes. the creation of a Senegalese country in which. The current context feels very different in terms of Islam and the state and in other parts of the region. Yes. Um, and I've heard that anyway, kind of attributed to to having had a Catholic, you know, a, a, a person from a minority religion as president um, for that period of time is would you because that feels important uh, in relationship to democracy and religion questions. So. A, I'm glad you raised that because we didn't talk about that in the context of we have here or the in the time we have, but it is important. We should take that. I feel like I want to just like repeat the essentialist things that I've heard Senegalese people tell each other. <laughs> right. 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 But, right. Not, too, but, right. but, but, I, but they know, matter because they yeah. keep getting repeated. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, and part of it is that, this, the yeah. consciousness in Senegal of what of, of what democracy That's in right. Senegal yeah. means. And That's one right. does hear that quite a bit. You know? Yeah, no, like there is a there's a great kind of like rhetorical kind of repetition of like we are a society that believes in conversation and discourse and mm -hmm. hospitality mm -hmm. and respect mm -hmm. and all these other kinds of things. And we are a society that is tolerant, right? Like these are things that are repeated commonly in conversation every day in Senegal. Right. I think. Thing. And but also things. like who am I talking to, right? Like I'm yeah. certainly listening to things on the radio and watching um and other things <laughs> like RTS one, um, but like, but these these are you know like I, I find it so fascinating to see the kind of explosion of political debate TV, like TV shows in Senegal um, and um, the various ways that there are like political fora everywhere, right? The discussions mm -hmm. happen almost everywhere about the politics that are occurring, about people forming opinions, and so um, it seems as though people are kind of mutually informing themselves, but also kind of finding themselves to be in conversation with people who might disagree yeah. with them about various kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that would be a different story in Cosmonauts. Um, in Southern Senegal. In Southern yeah. Senegal, where there has been, mm -hmm. you know, a separatist movement um, that kind of skews towards violence mm -hmm. in various kinds of cycles that it's been active for several Four decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
which Sangor did deploy troops um, there. Um, and more recently, um, I really wanted to deploy troops down in that region. Um, but I, I do think that at least north of the Gambia, there is a kind of understanding of Senegal as a kind of holistic space. Um, and, you know, the ideas of religious tolerance are also quite fascinating, and it depends on who you're speaking to, but, um, you know, I've participated in various kinds of events where Muslims are selling, celebrating Christmas with their, mm -hmm. I mean, who doesn't like a big party? But like Muslims are celebrating Christmas with their Christian Especially neighbors Sarah. and Christians are fasting yeah. um, during yeah. Ramadan, mm -hmm. right? Which starts next month. Yeah. Um, and so there is a kind of deep sympathy and empathy um, and a neighborliness, right? Um, and a pride there as well, mm -hmm. I think. And the state, I mean, to link it back, maybe one strand of, there are lots of ways that one could think about this. I'm thinking about the Ja-Sengor relationship and the fact that the Senegalese state, I mean, the way that the way that people mobilize and the way that that the that the Bloc um, Democratique Senegalais mobilized was by this union through this union that was intentionally, um, you know, driven by you know Senghor is Catholic, Ja is Muslim. They both have these different kinds of um, knowledge bases that they're drawing off and they're banding together to create this block. Um, this democratic block, and I, I do, I mean, without becoming too essentialist, I do think that matters. Yeah. I think it's something that people are invested in. I think that certainly um, colleagues of ours now in Senegal are, um, you know, there's an investment in trying to have, uh, there's an investment in having and sustaining very robust, complex discussions about a Muslim civil society in Senegal as well, um, and that is something that I appreciate about the political landscape in Senegal is how um, animated people are and engaged in having conversations about, you know, to your point. And I'll just say two things really quickly. I'm sorry, two things really quickly, if I can. Um, I think that when Mamadou Ja and Houtari of others uh, end up being imprisoned in 63, there are people who support Ja and who are left of Senghor, but they continue to do the work of the state, yeah. right? Like, Mama, uh, like Amadou Mahtar Mbo, like creates the education system, right? And he is left of Senghor. Um, there are other important actors that believe in state building and state institutions that continue to do that work. Um, and then something else that I find very fascinating about um, Senegal um, in more recent years is they also instituted Arite. Mm -hmm. Right, so all of the political parties have to put equal numbers of men and women up for election, um, and that has radically changed the way that um, national assembly looks. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it also leads to people throwing chairs at each other. Yeah, um, in this most recent year, um, which I found very fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, for another time. For another time about that. Though. Um, but mm -hmm. it, it does lend itself to having these particular kinds of institutions and interests yeah. in doing some political work. John Mason, and then- I actually think somebody over oh. here is- oh. I guess I'll, I have yeah. Yeah. several questions, but I'll just I'll just stick to one to, to you know, be brief. Uh, building off of Laurent's question and this uh, character of religious tolerance that you guys are, are seeing in Senegal, is that something that's in the constitution or protected in any legal, um, instruments or is that a cultural disposition it's a secular state but, but is the secularity part of the constitution yeah but i but to your side the second point of your question i do think there's a cultural there's a there is a cultural um sensibility towards wouldn't you would you say that this is true i mean i'm, I'm being careful because i feel like i'm speaking in essentialisms but I think that it's um, like the model of the country is I, one faith, one goal. That's right. That's true. <laughs> one faith, one goal. No, but it is. I think that. Um, I think. I mean, to your point about um, multi-religious neighborhoods and families um, in Senegal being being that's a very normative. That's a nor very normative characteristic. I think. Um, so I would say it's two things. One is. The constitution protects it, but I also feel like it is, a, I think it is a part of the cultural fabric. Yeah, I think Sangor was very committed to um, building an identity of, of the nation, mm -hmm. 
Right. And one that was flexible. Yes. John. So, so this being a school day, um, I think Leopold Sangor is being spoken about in colleges and universities all over the United States, scattered here and there. I don't think anybody's talking about him as a politician. <laughs> They're talking about him as yeah, a poet right. and as a philosopher yeah. of negritude, right? right? And him as a politician, I, I don't know if anybody besides you guys are mentioning. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> that's, 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 that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Which, which makes me think, um, of course, I'm exaggerating. Right, yeah. but you know what I mean, yeah. and I don't think yeah. I don't think you're going to argue with me. Um, so I'm interested in Senghor as the poet and the philosopher of negritude in Senegal. I mean, so how is that legacy alive, well honored, cherished by whom, by not, etc. So, take that one. Sure, sure. Um, I well, they did just open up his house on the Corniche and turn it into a museum in the past decade. Um, I think that he is much celebrated for the work that he has done to universalize the so-called Negro arts, as it was called in the 1960s, um, and the efforts to kind of ensure that the universal included mm -hmm. black arts, mm -hmm. right? And they weren't seen as something separate, mm -hmm. right? They were seen as something that um, contributed to a kind of global understanding of beauty mm -hmm. um, among various kinds of poetics. And I think that within Senegal, like Sheikh Tam um, published a book on this, on kind of Senghor and universalism in 2015. Um, and it was a love song. The book, right? So I absolutely, um, there, and I think that there are people who can talk about Senghor and his kind of achievements in the arts, in philosophy. You know, um, Suleiman Bashir Jen is someone who speaks of his kind of universalism within philosophy as well um, in the contemporary sphere. Um, but I think that there are also people who can do that and then also kind of like critique him as a politician, mm -hmm. right? who can see him as taking on the burden as someone who is invested in the arts in political life. Um, and, you know, he continued to publish throughout his political career. Um, and I guess I could leave it there, but yes, I do think, I do think that he, and I think within the kind of broader African diaspora, mm -hmm. he's really much better known for his contributions to Negritude oh, and towards, yeah. um, and, and kind of less of a kind of militant radicalism or a kind of commitment to Pan-Africanism like mm -hmm. you would see with Kwame Nkrumah, mm -hmm. right? Um, like Senghor opened Senegal's doors to kind of artists and cinematographers mm -hmm. and wanted to kind of put Dakar on the map in that way. Um, and that's also kind of when Gore became a site of return in that, 60, in that 1966 Best Man. Um, that was also a question about popular memory, too. Mm -hmm. So sort of on the, you know, like the, the level of the ordinary citizen, the man and woman on the street, um, how is he remembered? I'm cur really curious about that. I am, too. Um, <laughs> I am, too. I think people engage in politics a lot around contemporary politics. Um, His um, relations with Semben was not were problematic to say the least. Uh, and so if you were to you know, identify the two dominant cultural figures in many ways of, of modern Senegal, yeah. that, 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 that he did not like Simbin's political message. He didn't like Chato. Um, yeah. So I think there are, you know, there are problems with, with seeing Senghor as the great cultural liberal. Um, He's a complex figure. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is a great segue to you, Penny, if I may, just because of um, I know what your work is, but I don't know what your question is, but I know what your what you work on. Well, I, I was going to raise a question about some of yeah some of these connections. So, like, just two quick things. Um, both, first of all, this was just absolutely fabulous. I am like emphatically not an Africanist, and especially not a Franco-Africanist, but. Some of my transnational work will intersect with some of these. So I just 
this is so illuminating and I just, it was fabulous. One of the, you know, so thank you. Thanks so much. And I learned so much. So just a comment about the essentialism. I mean, I'm just wondering in a sense, I would like almost to invert that, that you are not being essentialist, but that today's political environment, which is putting pressure on academic questions is essentializing religious difference and missing how completely differently religion is politicized in this moment and just not historicizing religion enough. So, I mean, I don't think either of you are doing that, but that in a lot of ways, when you look at um, a whole host of, you know, globally in the post-45 era of multilinguistic, multi-confessionalist democratic projects, that um, Senegal stands out as one of the powerful models. And so it not at all, you know, so again, it's kind of like inverted. It, it, it's the religion that has to be problematized. And, but the second thing is, um, yeah, it is like, you know, just a very complex figure in another way this politics comes in. And I know Emily's, you know, it's like, the, this is like, it's, I'm starting to think it's like the one thing I know about the world or remember about the world, but with this, um, with the, you know, what they call like the Negro Arts Festival, the Festival of Black Arts, it's such a fascinating moment because James Baldwin and Harry Belafonte um, boycott that festival. And this is where the explosions in politics come in. And it's because, so the line there, it's like saying hor, pro-Western, that means French, that means US, you know, it's, he's, you know, tepid criticisms of the, um, of Rhodesian unilateral, you know, independence, I mean, Congo crisis is like, so all these things come from the outside in the sense of the Congo crisis. And then it creates this more internal divisions, which side are you on? And um, and that festival happens right after the overthrow of Nkrumah. And, you know, and um, it happens, you know, and then we're heading into civil war in Nigeria. So so that's really explosive in the moment. And, um, and then it's, you know, and then it kind of, so yeah, and I guess I kind of see from the international point, it's not, and but it's not, but it's never, I don't know that St. Horts then rejected. It's like, really, you know, there's that contradiction, like this, such an important poet of negritude. And, you know, so it, he doesn't become negatively politicized the way, you know, I think on a, on a from a more global level. Anyway, just, yeah. just a, it's kind of just an exhausted Friday afternoon comment, but I <laughs> love the, you know, just I loved your, you know, conversation and learned so much. But I think you bring up a really good point that I forgot to mention kind of about Senegalese civil society. And I think that like how Polarin and Nandinka speakers might have a, a, a different way of approaching this, but there is a wolfization of political discourse in Senegal across the 20th century as Wolof spreads. Um, because of peanut agriculture, because of the ways that you have so many important political institutions that are coastal in San Luis and Dakar. Um, and so despite the number of languages that are spoken in Senegal, um, there is an ability for many people to speak together and not mm -hmm. speak in a former colonial language. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is also pretty important mm -hmm. um, for Senegal. Um, and I also find that it's interesting that like you do see the rise of particularly powerful kind of Sufi groups in the late 19th century and in the 20th century um, who become political figures of them of themselves, but as far have remained committed um, to a kind of politic that doesn't lend itself to challenging the state. Well, I want to thank you for coming all the way. Well, for rain to join us an hour right no, 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 no. Is it rain? I did, it's rain. <laughs> um, thank you all for being with us. And um, there's a nice spread outside. And I also want to signal that for those who are intrepid and curious, um, there is a wonderful tour. Uh, that John Mason is leading at 4 p.m. in the small special collections of Visions of Progress. So some of us are going to grab a bite. We're going to walk over to small, and you are welcome to join our merry band of rainy walkers. Um, and um, thank you all for, for Thanks, coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Great.